I'd like to begin right now. And uh, my talk is titled Cake Jam. And I originally planned to have like a real long talk with slides and being prepared and all of that. But uh, yesterday I was told the talk wouldn't happen. So what you're seeing right now is going to be sort of ad hoc. And I hope like most stuff will work, but fingers crossed. And uh, all right, what's the talk going to be about? I mainly want to like go about uh, go over all the useful small things you find in the Cake PHP core, and when you develop, that make your life easier, but that are not necessarily advertised as big features, and that many of you probably don't know about. Like a lot of the stuff that's on my list, I didn't know about for the longest time. And so the other thing is, if you guys have any questions or want to interrupt, feel free to do that, because there's also going to be plenty of time of for like discussing problems regarding uh, stuff you do in Cake PHP, and maybe we can come up with something. All right, let's get this started. I got like a little checklist for what I want to rant about, and the first thing is the set class. How many of you are using the set class? Well, about half of the people here, so I'm pretty sure that the people who haven't raised their hand will be very happy to learn about what Zed can do. Mm -hmm. Basically, one of the things in Cake PHP is you always end up with this huge array structures because that's what the models do. They bring back those huge arrays from find all, and now you want to navigate those arrays and like extract certain values and do stuff with them. And that's what the Zed class is really good at. All right, let's like look at an example of what the Zed class can do. All right, I prepared like a little test controller right here where I'm just gonna type some stuff up and then see what it does. Let's make sure this works. All right, let's say, I think I have a little example right here. Okay, let's say you have an array like that, which could be, or well, the font size should be a little bit bigger, shouldn't it? All right, can everybody read this now? Okay, cool. And so let's say you have an array like this, and you want to create a new array that contains all the IDs of all the users. For example, to display them in a list or to do something else with them. Well, how would you do this with mobile PHP? You would say, uh, create a new array called IDs, <coughs> Then you would for each over all the uh, users. And then you'd probably do something like IDs and append uh, the current user ID. And what you'll have is like an array that's containing all the array, uh, IDs. Well, you'll find yourself doing stuff like this a lot. And so one of the neat things about CakePHP is it's not only framework helping you to it, like create web applications, it's also framework giving you like nice little small tools that are essentially many uh, tools you'd find in the Swiss Army knife. And so, for example, this problem can be just as easily solved by saying IDs is set extract. So um, what you see is the first parameter we pass to set extract is the array we want to get information out of. And the second parameter is a string essentially representing a path we want to follow. You can imagine that to be like an X path selector. It's a, quite a bit less powerful, but it's pretty good for uh, manipulating complex arrays. So, And uh, it would, I really like this thing right there. So what does this do? Well, basically this uh, N in brackets right here tells the set class that um, the first level of the array is numerical index, and it makes it go through all of the numeric indexes, meaning it goes, it loops over the zero element, the one element, and whatever elements it would find. Then it goes down inside the array, looking for a user key, and then it goes down inside the user key, looking for the ID. <coughs> and then it simply returns your result set containing those uh, values it found based on the path. So if we remove this right here, we'll see it has the same effect. Now, one of the cool things is you can get fancy with this. Uh, another function in Z that is uh, using the exact same extract method, it's called Z combine. 
And what we often find ourselves doing is like creating a drop-down list where you have, let's say, users, and the value of those option elements needs to be a user ID because you don't post like user strings back to your application. Well, to, in order to generate such a list where you have the IDs as the keys right here, and then the username as a string, as a uh, value, you can use the set combined function. And it's pretty simple too. The only thing you need to do in order to make this work is to give it two paths. The first one is a pass for taking the array keys, meaning in our case IDs, and the second pass is the one where it finds the values. And when we execute this, we'll get a nice little array containing the IDs mapped to the names. Now, Neil uh, asked me yesterday about uh, how could this be used for combining fields as well. So for example, instead of just, like you have a user table, you oftentimes have like a first name and a last name and you want to have the uh, keys of your array to be the IDs, and the, last, uh, and the values to be the first name, then a space, and then the last name. And uh, that is a common problem, and you can do it in one-liner. And uh, we found out this is the way you can do it. One second. I'll actually split it up over multiple lines because it's a little bit big. <laughs> yeah, you can put every, everything in one line, right? <laughs> but um, you'll see that it makes sense to put it in one line. Okay. Okay, let me explain what this does. Well, we already looked at this example. All this is doing is it's going through the uh, users array we got right there, and then it's finding us ID values. That's simple. The second thing is a little bit more tricky, and it's using a function called set format. And uh, I should explain what this does by itself for a second, so it makes sense. It takes us up here, and that puts the result. All right, basically, there's a couple things going on. The first thing is you pass in the users arrays that you want to manipulate, or in this case, uh, have a modified version of. And uh, the second parameter is what you want to have returned. Basically, you can imagine this to be some weird form of regular expressions where you have capturing groups, and those are your two capturing groups. So for example, this is the first capture, and this is the second capture right here. The only difference is instead of using an regex to get those capture groups, you pass in an array of one or more paths, and then based on what number the uh, string selector is in your array, that's the reference value for the capturing group. So in this case, you create one capturing group with all the first names, and a second one with all the last names right here. And then you can basically tell uh, the set format class, return me an array of strings where you combine the matches from the first names with the matches from the last names. So long explanation, pretty simple result. You basically get back the names, uh, how they should be formatted. First name, space, last name, which is kind of cool, because now you can save a lot of work in, of like looping through all the arrays and manually concatenating those strings yourself. And since the format that is being returned is flexible, you can come up with all kinds of cool stuff based on that. Well, so to finish the example, what we need to do is we need the names, we need the IDs, and then the results are basically a combination of both of these. And we can do this simply using array combine. So now we get the user IDs returned, and we get the map to the first uh, name and the last name concatenated by a string. So that's really handy stuff if you try to rapidly develop applications and you don't want to spend all your time writing loops, which has other disadvantages as well, because I find code getting more complex the more nestings you have. So whenever I can avoid a level of nesting, I'll try to do that. And of course, this is not as optimized as a direct for each would be. But then again, how often do you have a problem with like generating a list like this a little bit inefficient? I mean, we're talking about probably not even more than a fr fraction of a millisecond here. So um, I think it's really nice to have the possibility to really shorten down your code 
make it easy to read. And if you need performance later on, you can still go in and replace all those stat extract calls and whatever else you're using. Um, another method, oh, let's check in my list. Yeah, another method I like to use is set merge, which essentially does what every merge recursive should be doing, but somehow isn't. Mainly like if you have two arrays and you want to merge them together, not on just one level, but on several levels, set merge will do it for you. Um, in order to explain this properly, let's make a little example. Let's say you have, um, let's split this up in two fractions. You have two arrays containing information about one user, in our case, Neil right here. This is the piece number one, where you have his uh, ID, his first and his last name. And well, you happen to t have an array number two, where you also have his credit card. Let's say you have his ID and his credit card, so you know it belongs to him. I was looking in your wallet Hello. last night. <laughs> 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 all right, and so now what you want to do is you want to combine all the information about uh, Niels that you have, because you're, let's say, working for Google, and you like to just collect data. And so in PHP, if you now use every merge, you'll notice uh, it will not do what you want it to do. For example, if our result would be an array merge <coughs> of information piece one and information piece two, uh, it will simply do the following. It will loop through both of these arrays, or actually only over the second one, and as soon as it finds the user key, it will overwrite the user key of array one completely, and essentially wiping out Neil's first name and his last name, only leaving him to his credit card number. <laughs> And so let's check if that's actually true. Oh, no. It's wiping out me. Um, line 11. The extra question you mark after the last <coughs> uh, Oh, my array is not closed. Right. So essentially, you wiped out Neil's identity. And now you can't use his credit card information to do something evil with it. And so. Five years. <laughs> And so what that merge does, it simply uh, goes deep inside of your array and will combine it in a way that makes sense. Namely, using all the keys that are new in the second array and only overwriting those, but leaving the keys already in existence uh, untouched. And it also works well with numeric indexes in terms of combining them. And uh, it's, it's quite useful if you try to merge big array structures into one another. All right, another tip. Read test cases. How many of you guys actually go into the test cases of Cake PHP when they try to find out how something works? I do. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, like a little bit than half of you guys. It's really since 1.2, the test coverage is being improving constantly, and like most of the stuff and all those utility functions you may never heard about are documented in the test cases simply by providing you with examples. And I personally learn the best when I have examples of like multiple ways of calling a function and seeing what it does. For example, if you really want to study how any of the set stuff works, you can go in the set test case right here. And you can, for example, look for the formatting function where the formatting is tested. And you can see all, you see like an array that's being used as a base. It doesn't fit the screen quite well. But uh, you can see several examples of how this array can be used to combine values. And so if you look at it for a while, you'll find out that uh, pretty much all the usage cases you can uh, have for this function are documented. And it will also show you like probably the limitations of it. If you don't see a complex example of something you try to accomplish, it's likely uh, it's not there because, uh, well, it wouldn't work. <laughs> because when you unit test, you try to like use a f test the function at its maximum functionality. And so uh, if it's not tested, it's usually a sign of not working yet. But the, sometimes it's wrong. If the unit test hasn't simply been written, then <coughs> don't use this logic. If you're doing something complex, then just write a test for it. Yeah, it's yeah, write a test yourself. No, and uh, yeah, so reading reading through the unit test can be really, really helpful, especially if you're new to KPHP, just to like get an overview over what functionality is in existence 
and what like little small helper functions are there that can help you. All right, next. Um, <coughs> one of the things that I notice with like some developers in CakePHP, um, their controllers don't only consist of actions that can be executed and that are exposed to the public, but sometimes you find controllers where there's like 10 or 20 functions with underscores or two underscores, which in CakePHP simply means those functions are protected or hidden. Either way, not accessible from the public. Well, sometimes there are legitimate usage cases for those. But to me, when you use protected and private functions, it's usually a sign of bad design uh, or smell of bad design, meaning you're doing something that is not quite reusable. You're doing something you don't want anybody else to do. So essentially, a good example is a lot of times you have data structures, and you need to like manipulate them. And one of those manipulations in one of your functions is a little bit more complex. And so you put it in like a do manipulation x function and you underscore it. And so you try to like remove it so you can read your code better. But what you're re really doing is you're ignoring a pattern. So there's mostly always a pattern there. For example, that's what the set class is all about, making it easier to extract array information. Now, a lot of people would previously maybe put all of their complex for each loop in like a separate function. And the set class does the exact opposite thing. It tries to find the pattern, solves the pattern, and then makes it possible for you to not use hidden functions. Uh, a good example for that is, let's say you want to clean up your room. You have like a room class, and your floor is dirty, and now you write a function where you explicitly tell it, um, okay, go to this part of my room, pick up that, go to this part and clean the carpet, and things like th and stuff like that. So this function is not really reusable for any other class that you might ever write because, I mean, how many room classes is the usual project consistent of? So what you do instead is you think of what tool would uh, solve this problem and what tools could I make that are useful for other classes. And so in this case, you might want to like create a vacuum cleaner because that's a tool that can be reused by other classes. And so whenever I see too many underscore functions or uh, protected private functions, I'm thinking, hey, why, why is this being done? Is there any level or of abstraction that could be applied? Is there any pattern behind this? Sometimes you won't find the pattern. Sometimes you're doing something that's completely unique and deserves to be hidden away and uh, so you can sleep at night. But uh, when you are uh, when you really think about the problem at hand, you usually can find the, a solution, and it's well worth to spend 30 minutes on finding a pattern. All right, um, the compact function. I like this one. Who, who knows what the compact function does? All right, again, like about half of the people. Uh, the compact function is really neat if you try to pass variables from one place to another. For example, let's say you have an action in CakePHP, and you have, let's say, three variables containing uh, some stuff. I'm just going to make an example real quick. Um. Okay, now you have three variables, and you want to pass all of those variables to your few. Uh, normally, you would do the following in CakePHP. You'd call the set method, you'd pass the name of the variable you want to pass, and then you're repeating yourself essentially by specifying this name again. You do this, oops, you do this three times for each variable you want to pass, and you end up cluttering your code with something that should be just one simple action. Namely, get all my few variables, put them in the few, and don't worry about them. Well, the compact method is really neat in order to help you with this. What does it do? Um, let's look at uh, what it does. Basically, uh, you call the compact function with uh, any amount of string parameters, and all of these string parameters represent one variable in your current context. <coughs> and uh, it essentially takes all these variables, reads their values, and returns them to you as an array. And the array has keys that are the variable names. So in our case, we would get an array like the following. Oops. No, no, I think it's still loading.
Hmm. <coughs> My web server doesn't like me. That's what I meant when I said I wasn't prepared. We can also skip like the next ten examples, <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> which would kind of suck, you know. I think you have strings in the in the callback function rather than variables. I have what? In the callback function, you use strings rather than variables. No, no. you actually. Oh wait, what do you mean? I got strings here. <coughs> yeah. Yeah. Um. Oh, what's that? Offsets and string. Hmm. So it isn't my web server, it's cake. <laughs> uh, no, I had it running, but I updated man, but it lost. And why would it do that? What line? Oh, I was using this function earlier, tokenized. Does anybody see like a tokenized call in here? Yeah. Well, like, we could swap to plain PHP for this one. Oh, you might want to revert those changes I told you to make. Oh. Oh. That makes some sense. Okay, that's probably going to fix it. Yep. Good call, Nate. Thanks. All right, so do we get the right page? No, no. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. Yeah. All right, so essentially what it did, it went through all the variables that were in our current context, and only the ones we specified. Was the other few better? I don't know. And uh, it essentially puts them into one array and uh, maps the variable names against the values. And since the set class also accepts an array, that's a really short way of passing stuff to your controller. And it's also a really short or nice shortcut if you have a function and you want to have one array containing the state of this function, put it somewhere, and possibly continue with all the stuff later on. Because there's <coughs> another plain PHP method that does the exact opposite. Instead of um, compacting several variables in your uh, current function into one array, it takes several variables out of an array and puts them in the context of your function. For example, um, let's make it like so. Let's say we have an array that we directly pass into extract and we contain a key called for our one for our variable and foo as a value, then uh, running extract on it will take this array keys and puts them into our current function as variables. And the reason, there's two reasons why I mentioned both extract and uh, compact. First of all, a lot of cake PHP applications that you might need to work with in future use the compact uh, notation for passing strings to the few so you know what's going on. And also, CakePHP uses extract quite often inside the core to um, make it easy to pass all of your parameters to a function inside the first uh, parameter and then extract them inside the function. So when you ever come across this in the core, you know what's going on and will make it easier for you to understand it. All right, what's next? Encoding UTF-8 and database PHP. <coughs> How many of you guys had struggles with, like, PHP, uh, a cake PHP and UTF-8 databases before, where the database was UTF-8, but cake didn't get it, or things like that. Quite a couple, yeah. 
And um, so what Cake now does is you usually, like in the past, you had to hack app model and you had to put in a construct function and then uh, basically send a little SQL snippet saying set names UTF-8 to make sure the connection would be using UTF-8 and stuff would get from the database in UTF-8 to your Cake PHP application in UTF-8. Well, now the Cake PHP core supports this, thanks to Mariano. And uh, if you look into your database file, it's unfortunately not in the template, but you can do encoding, and then you can say UTF-8. It's and the last one in the doc block comment. In the doc block comment? Yeah, well, go back down. <coughs> it's the very last one listed. Oh, okay, it's in the doc block, but it's just not in the template. Right. Okay. If you bake it. Read the <laughs> fucking manual, I guess. <laughs> yeah, and so that's a really neat way to make sure your connection is in UTF-8. So always sets this in your database PHP file. But this might be 1.2. Mariano, Mariano, has this been ported into 1.1 as well? It might have because it's in the data source. Always used it in 1.1 and it worked fine. It works in 1.1? Yeah. You checked that it runs the query, set yeah. names? Okay. Well, okay, good, great. So you can also use this if you're in the latest 1.1 core. Models as namespaces. Okay, some people might disagree with me on this, but um, when I write Cake PHP applications, I s a lot of times I need to have some global functions that I can call from everywhere. A lot of times they are related to, for example, the user. My most common uh, usage case for this is, uh, at no matter where I am in my application, if it's a view, if it's a controller, if it's a model, it's sometimes useful to know what's the ID of the user that is currently logged in, or what's the name of this user and things like that. So what I do is I sometimes abuse my models as namespaces uh, to give me functions like, let's say, user get, which is a function I have in my KPHP application. Basically what it does is, when I say I want to get the user ID of the user that's currently logged in, I call user get ID. And so no matter if I'm in a field, no matter if I'm in a uh, in a controller or in a model, uh, this function works from everywhere. In order to not mix those functions up with uh, any other thing, anything else that's in the model, <coughs> uh, I use PHP 5 and uh, prefix them with a static prefix, so it's clear this function is not part of uh, active record, and so that helps to distinguish it, and I think it's just really nice to have this kind of stuff. I also have, for example, group get ID, which would get me the ID of the user that's currently logged in. And uh, I also have, for example, a global login function where I can pass in like a user ID and then suddenly this user is logged in. So, I mean, the auth component is good and I try to use it whenever I can, but sometimes I just have to like agree on a hack like this to make it work and I'll, I'll run it by Nate and Gary and Larry yes, and see if we can will. come up with something. Oh? Yes, yes you will. <laughs> yes, you will. Well, they'll run something by me. I don't know. Um, anyway, that's a trick I find useful sometimes. I also have one fancy slide that I actually finished before the talk, and so I'm probably going to continue with that. Just skip through this real quick. <coughs> okay. How many of you guys have worked with ACL and Cake PHP before? All right, quite a few. How many of you were like confused? Or how many of you were really confused by it and found it difficult to pick up? <laughs> Even the developers are raised their hands. Okay, well, what I found is ACL is very powerful, but it's also really gigantic and hard to understand. And it takes, I mean, if you've never worked with it before, you're probably gonna, it's probably gonna take you like 20 hours before you get something up and running so that you understand and think you'd be able to maintain. And so, or six years, right. <laughs> and while, while there are plans for maybe changing HCL in future and making it easier, right now it is a little bit hard to get started with it. And so what I did, and this was really a while ago when ACL was even broken and didn't even work, so uh, to justify myself and Nate not killing me. Um, what I did is I came up with what I call simple ACL. It's basically a string-based rule system where you have one string expressing certain rules and you can apply it to any object in your application. What do I mean by this? 
for example, let's say you have a couple users, Bob, Jim, and Tom, and you have a couple of control actions that you want to expose to Bob, Jim, and Tom, and you want to make sure not everybody gets the same access. Well, with ACL, uh, you'd have to write, you've had to set up database tables, you have to do all the configuration, you'd have to do a before filter, and then figure out why something doesn't work. Well, I found what's really easy is to make the entire process of uh, deciding who gets to access what string-based. And I use a syntax that is uh, pretty easy to understand. Basically, uh, I start with a simple string that contains always two, th two things. The first thing is the controller I'm interested in, and the second is the action. So, if you, for example, if you use star, then it's basically a wild char matching any controller or any action. So if Bob has uh, the rule set uh, star colon star apply to him, he can access all the actions <coughs> right here. Now, let's say Jim isn't as lucky as Bob and wants, gets different access. For example, he gets access to everything, but he does not get access to anything regarding the user controller. And so the way this is done is you first define he's allowed to access everything, but then you add a second rule, separated by a comma, excluding things from it. And you can build up any amount of strings and levels of nesting where you first allow things and then exclude things. And it essentially works like ACL, only that you have a simple text string instead of a complex database uh, model for doing it. So uh, in this case, this would mean Jim is allowed to access a post controller because he's allowed to access all controllers except users. So both actions are allowed. He's also allowed to access the admin action of posts. And he's not allowed to access users because the rule is saying no go for Jim when it comes to the user's controller. Well, to show how this can be made even a little bit more complex, as an example, uh, Tom gets the following rule. He's allowed everything regarding posts, but not any index actions, regardless of the controller. So post index is not allowed for him. However, post view is allowed, because we said everything except the index action and posts is ready for Tom to be used then he's also not allowed to use any admin actions. So post admin add is not accessible by him. And the last thing is he's allowed to access everything regarding the user's controller, the user's admin. Oh, actually, this is wrong. Oh, no. Never mind. Um, the way ACL works, oh, this ACL implementation is, it uh, goes from the rules from the left to the right, and the last rule applying to whatever you're looking at is, is used. So when there's first an exclusion for admin, but it's then overwritten by another rule, even if it's more channelized, it's going to overwrite it. So that's, that's the way it works. And so the user's controller is suddenly accessible to him, even including the ad admin actions. You got a question? Yeah, with, your, um, with the second to last rule there, not admin stuff. Yeah, oh, the it's controller. You, 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 you're right. Let me fix that. that look right now? Okay. Oh, well, comma should be on the next line. All right, yeah. Let's go through this again real quick. <coughs> Oops, all right, never mind. I clicked one time too much. Uh, anyway, so that is basically uh, the last rule would allow him to access everything uh, in the user's controller, even so admin actions would normally be forbidden, because the last rule matching is the one that's taken. Well, the beautiful thing about this is it's really a short implementation. All it takes to get this going is, I think, about 20 lines of code. Let me see if I can find it somewhere. Yeah, it's a little bit of regex magic, but it's simple enough. So if you take like 20 minutes, you can say, I read through the entire uh, implementation, and I know what's going on. So essentially, it's just splitting up the string by commas, knowing each thing separated by a comma is a different rule. And then it's just looping through all of them and returns the last rules that match. And it also takes care of some uh, negative conditions. So 
yeah, if you have a simple application where you don't need to implement one monster of a rights management system and uh, you just want to get it done quickly, that's one approach that has worked well for me in the past. All right, we got some more stuff. Who in here is using the request handler? Not a lot of people. Do you know what the request handler can do to people who are not using it? And what it's used for? Okay, then let's have a little look at the request handler. How about the font size a little bit? Is it okay in here? Or Oops. like that? Yes, there you go. All right. I think we could directly look into that it's a request handler because the interesting stuff is fairly simple to understand. Oops. All right. Those are the functions that are existing inside the request handler. It's a component that you include, in, let's say, your app controller on the controller you want to use it, and it exposes quite a couple of useful functions. So this is one you'll always use if you deal with Ajax. Uh, you can basically tell one HTTP reg request using uh, Ajax apart from one that's coming in using the web browser directly. So if you do this in your controller right here, you get in trouble for hacking inside the core file. <laughs> um, So if you execute this inside your controller, you can apply different logics to Ajax requests coming in than you would apply to normal requests. Now, there's some shortcomings to this. First of all, it expects uh, this uh, environment condition to be set, which I believe is something the Ajax library you're working with has to do, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, uh, prototype and jQuery will Both do, and I think most other major libraries do, but if you decide to write your own Ajax functionality, uh, make sure you set this header, or yeah, I believe it's a header yeah. being set. <coughs> and uh, another thing is I heard from some people that apparently some firewalls <coughs> sorry, uh, will go in and take out this header because they think it's some form of hacking <coughs> or whatever. So you should not rely on it. If you need to make that sure it's an HX request, directly set a parameter in the HX request. So uh, if you have that under control. Otherwise, there's no reliable way of doing it because any proxy could come in and filter out any of the headers. So it's, it's good enough for most usage cases, but you should be aware of the shortcomings. Um, what else is there? <coughs> is XML is kind of cool. If the client wants to have an XML document returned, uh, I think it's using the accept header. Is that what it does, yeah. Nate? Yeah. yeah, if the accept tether uh, specifies XML first or anywhere in there, how's well, it doing? The it? router extension stuff uses, um, works with the accept, hand, accept header yeah. and the handling that goes into that. Um, the prefers method, what that actually does is checks if um, XML, it actually accepts XML ahead of some other common types. Yeah. Okay, so basically this is a way of seeing if the client is interested in XML, <coughs> and if you have some form, you can serve it. Uh, is SSL, it's also interesting, you can check if the current request is done using HTTPS, and maybe use different things like check <coughs> that, it, that the current connection is SSL before you submit a security, uh, security relevant form, and so if it's not SSL, <coughs> do a redirect first, or do not accept the post at all. Um, some other stuff is is mobile, which is essentially running a regex, checking for most common mobile devices. And uh, I believe uh, what it doesn't do, it won't tell you what mobile device it is. Is there any check for that, Nate? Is there any check telling you what mobile device is coming in? No, but we will have an is iPhone method. <laughs> Oh no, there's none. Um, no, there's uh, a. <coughs> it's just, it's just up here. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so the iPhone is the first one checked against. Yeah. Yeah. Well, naturally. Yeah. Some other really useful stuff is, for example, is post, 
or uh, there's is post, there's is put, is get, and is uh, I believe delete should be somewhere there as well. Yeah. Oh, right here. So what you need to use this for is uh, pretty simple. For example, sometimes you want to uh, ha you have a control action that does two things. If there's no post coming in, it just displays the user with a page he needs to fill out, and if a post is coming in, it sends it to a model. So quite commonly, you would have uh, an if statement in your function or in your action like this. Checking if it's a get request, and if so, returning, and essentially rendering the view. Another thing to note here is uh, this is a way to avoid unnecessarily nestings in your code. So like, for example, a lot of times people would maybe write something like this and then put their code here, even so it's totally unnecessary. Whenever you can exit a function, you should put in a return statement and remove a level of nesting. It's just going to make your code a lot better and uh, easier for other people to read as well. So anyway, uh, is get, is post, is put, and is delete are important to check against. For example, if you have a delete action inside your controller, you want to make pretty sure it's uh, that the request that is coming in is, for example, not a get request. Because uh, if it's a get request, then you're violating the HTTP protocol specifications, which states that a get request should never change anything on the server. It should never trigger an action. It should just return content. And so people who've ignored this in the past and had like delete links and they were uh, accessible using get suddenly found their web page being deleted by Google because Google was coming through and just following all those delete links. And suddenly the web content was gone. So make sure to never create a delete function that works if you call it with get. It's going to be a pretty unpleasant surprise. Um, is there more on the request handler, Nate, that should be pointed out? Um, yeah, the stuff that happens in startup, probably. Uh, I'm not an expert on that. Do you want to talk a little bit on it? or? Sure. Another useful function is get client IP. Uh, yes. It returns you the IP address of the current client. You want me to go to startup? Yeah. Okay, so the first thing it does is um, all components have this new convention in 1.2 where you can set an enabled property to true or false, um, which determines whether or not the callbacks fire. Um, so that applies to pretty much any component. And um, I think that's actually enforced now in where the where the callbacks are called, so you don't have to, I can actually take that first if block out. Um, so the first thing it does here is it checks um, if an extension got returned from the router, in which case it tells the, uh, the controller to render as that particular type, which changes the, uh, the um, content type header based on the um, content type map, which is up above in the, in the request handler properties. Now, or if it's an AJAX request, it tells the controller to switch to the AJAX layout, which by default in Kate, the, um, the default AJAX layout that comes installed with it is just empty. Um, so it disables the layout, so it's just the content of the action. Um, that right there. Yeah. And you can add uh, your own custom types to that. Um, let's see what else. Yeah, so. Um, with the automatic AJAX handling makes it a lot easier to reuse your views for both standard um, HTTP requests and AJAX requests. Um, and then the next thing it does is checks if the, um, the content type, if it's a post or put request, it checks if the content type is XML or matches any XML type. And so if it takes all the post data that was sent to sent in this request and actually converts it to an XML object and assigns it to the this data property of uh, the controller, which we touched on yesterday, so you can send that directly onto the model. And that's what that does. Yeah, so essentially, it will try to figure out what kind of request is coming in and try to serve the proper content type based up on that. Right. So does that work in JSON? Yes. It does not. Um, it does not? No, only because um, JSON live, like, writing a JSON parser is kind of prohibitive, and the only, there's only one included in the PHP core in, I think, 5.2 and up. So we don't handle that natively because we can't write a library, we can't include a library. 
working and there's no course for it. But you can actually write a component um, that makes use of the same stuff um, in the same way that the request handler does. So if you want to accept JSON data, all you have to do is add a JSON component that if you're running 5.2 just says JSON decode and assigns it to the data <coughs> that you're no, I'm not sure what you meant. When you said when you said does it work with JSON, did you mean JSON being actually posted as a string to the server or JSON being returned from the server? Uh, sent. Sent. Okay, yeah. no. You're using straight post. Yes, right? I'm using straight post. I actually I did so write you're a converting all of your variables and stuff to a in a serialized string. Yeah. JQuery just gonna mention it real quick, has a function for it called I believe $.http data or something like that, which essentially will uh, convert a multi uh, one dimensional array or object into a post string, but uh, it's not recursive at this point. So um, I wrote a recursive function and I should clean it up and maybe submit it to see if the core has any interest in it. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, it doesn't work if you send a JSON string. It does not work, but you can pretty easily. I mean, you see this, I wrote that, and like the important stuff is happening in like five, six lines of code. So you can pretty easily hook in your own component to do that. This one's like maybe in. Oh, actually, you got this in uh, inside the controller, right? As a referrer function? Um, yeah. Maybe we should mention the controller function. Yeah, Who, who's used the referrer function before in the controller? Yeah. Like almost nobody? Okay, what it basically does is it will return you the referrer of the request coming in. That means where was the user one page ago. So this is something people can disable in the browser, and it's not 100% reliable. But right, it's you can actually tamper with it since it's just an HTTP header that yeah. gets sent to the server. Um, you don't want to rely on this for security, but um, for convenience, it's quite good. Yeah, for convenience, for redirecting people back, for making sure that. <coughs> at least for simple requests that they're maybe coming from a certain page. But again, that's like a defense in depth thing for simple attacks, not something you want to rely on for actual security. Yeah, I mean, well, if you, if you authenticate this session and do your proper security, right. each of the actions itself, and right. using the refer, even you know, if they try to hack it to get into a different URL, it'll still redirect them to where you want them to go. Anyway. Right, yeah, it's, it's really just a convenience thing. Okay, like for example, a common usage case where it makes sense to use this is let's say you have an index action of uh, posts from a blog, and after the user edits one of those blog posts by following an edit link and coming to the edit action, you might want to send him back to the index action, <coughs> back to all the other posts he can edit. And so the way you would do this is by saying, get the refer, uh, the previous site the user was on, so in this case, the uh, index page, and redirect them back to back to that page. Oh, yeah, um, this will redirect to the refer, but then if there is no refer, yeah, it will automatically assume that if there's no refer, it's post index. So meaning if somebody disabled refers, or uh, if let's say there's, yeah, I guess only if somebody disabled it. Yeah, so it's it's not a, there for whatever reason. Doesn't right? the uh, uh, moment already do that? Yeah. Um, that's that's. Um, just for specifically for the login now. Yeah. Right, right. No, I'm just saying if you want to use the off component, that's already built in. Um, yeah, I think what it is there is doesn't it actually store the redirect URL in the session? I believe it does. Okay. Yeah, that actually stores where you're coming from in the session, so it's pretty much guaranteed to um, be accurate. And so it doesn't use this method, but. Right. It, oh, okay. <coughs> yeah, and you could all. Also locked, like in the session, as Nate said, what the referrer is, yeah. which is a more reliable way of doing it. Right. Yeah, it's sometimes a problem because if something comes up and you get stuck in the session, you can get stuck in it. Yeah, yeah. As you clear your session. Yeah, well, be yeah, if you're breaking, writing broken code, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just to let you know. Yeah. Clear your sessions. Then, no, this, like the case. Okay, uh, the case for this is like you have an other added link like in the front end of your blog where if you're logged in as an admin you can click on it, it will send you back to the front end instead of the back end index action. Yeah. So that's what you use it for. All right, let's see what else we have. Oh, um, actually you can just disable cache, jump to uh, disable cache, it's another method of things. Oh, disable cache. Yeah. Is it a method? Yeah. yeah. Um, 
Yeah, oh, this, this is, is cool. This is just like another convenience one that most people don't know about. It just disables all the uh, typical cache headers. So if you don't want a particular request to be cached for whatever reason, um, just call that. I didn't know about that. Yeah, <laughs> That's cool. Yeah. And oh, post conditions, you want to do that one too? Post conditions? Yeah. Hey, uh, that? That's, that one's a little more complicated than that too. Um, well, if you want to jump to it, it's another method in it. Post conditions? Yeah. Um, is it really useful? Well, it's, um, <laughs> what this does is it takes post data that comes in in the typical you know, cake post data structure and actually reconfigures it into a, uh, a search conditions array that you can use for searching. So it's just like a convenience thing. <coughs> um, and you can, can you write a line on the list that we should be demonstrating? Um, <coughs> sure. So let's say um, we're just going to do a simple one. So our data array is, um, we'll just say this data. Wow, your keys are so much bigger than mine. Array. Post. So let's just say we're um, submitting a post title like new. So there's our posted data. Hmm. Um, so then we call this post conditions. And then if we leave the first parameter empty, it'll actually pick up this data by default. And then we'll say where op is like. And what that'll do is it'll give us back an array that looks like uh, this <coughs> post dot title like I think it just does or yeah it should just do like um, that's it does that make sense? Yeah. Am I right. correct if that is something you might not want to do if you don't trust the user? Um, essentially, you create any kinds of conditions, right? Well, what you do is you set this op yeah. um, parameter thingy, and it will make sure that all the um, fields are, or field values are prefixed with that operation so they can't specify their own in the value. So as long as you always <laughs> specify this op. Okay, you speak up a bit. Yeah, um, so you, in this op parameter here, uh, make sure you always pass a value to that. In fact, I think even if you don't pass anything, it forces it to be equal. Um, maybe not. But yeah, just make sure you're always filling in this op parameter um, so that prefixes whatever value with the particular um, comparison operator. Yeah, it says to equal because then you pass those conditions to your find, <coughs> right. to your find all basically. And it just works. And that would, that would handle it. Um, and, and it would also escape all the things coming across so that you can show it. So there we go. There's that. All right. Um, another cool thing with the configure class in 1.2 is if you have an application that needs a little configuration, you might want to use a custom configure file. I think it's even in 1.1, right? The configure class was a configure class backward to 1.1. Well, there's parts of it that are, but I don't think the load, I don't think right. I think configure load is in there. We use it in, uh, no, no, we used no, no. it. It wasn't in 1.1. I think it is. Is it? Oh yeah, actually, we use it. I use it. <laughs> the moral of the story is, no matter what, update to 1.2. <laughs> oh, yeah. But it's not stable, so we won't do that. Right. But it's more stable than, uh, no, I would actually argue no, that no, no, no. 1.2 is more stable than 1.1. You wouldn't, one you wouldn't do any product, uh, productive web, website on, on a video. Uh, I, I don't do that. Just release it stable when we do that. All right. <laughs> All right, then I will. There's no way. We can have a beta version marked as stable if that helps. <laughs> <laughs> so my, cool. com my company goes back to beta, and it's okay. 
No, it's alright. <laughs> I, I would actually argue that it's more stable than one. Like in the logo? Yeah, you gotta change the logo back. Yeah. So, anyway. Actually, let, let's ask this. Do people in here have production apps using 1.2? Yeah, they would. All right. Crazy. <laughs> crazy, guys. <laughs> I don't think I should have that. Yeah, I mean, everybody knows that when you, when you keep moving with the latest 1.2 core, things sometimes change and you have to update your application. But usually the features you get from it are well worth it. So, um, your answer would be no, it's not worth it? No, my answer would be no, I have no problem with 1.2. Oh, really? No problem. Oh, in Europe, you don't. Yeah. Just trying to get it to release it. You know. Hey, everybody, give it to you. Okay. I was going to say I've had problems. Of course. Did we have that? Oh yeah. Well, um, like what? What problems did we have? Well, um, I've been actually building a blog tutorial, which I realize there's a lot of blogs and plugin blogs already. But my idea was to research as many as of the um, community committed components as possible and try to combine the best ones uh, to make a blog and I also want to show off some jQuery stuff. And, uh, I've come across a lot of the functionality that works in your app directory it will not work in the plugin directory. Like behaviors don't work for plugins. They do now. I but I, well, I, look, I looked at the tickets and found that there was fixed, but the version I had, which I thought was the, the stable <coughs> release, the current stable one too, it's not fixed, so it must be a, a release after that that fixed it. Yeah, I think, so. yeah, I think it was shortly after that. Um, but at that point, we just hadn't enabled the loading of everything possible from plugins. It was only some stuff, so behaviors was just one thing we hadn't gotten to yet. Garrett, let me ask you this real quick. Do you want another like five or ten minutes at the end before we need to leave the room? Uh, yeah, I mean, I would say skip this one and go on to your class registry one. Class registry one? Yeah. Okay. S this one right there? Yeah. Okay. Um, one of the <laughs> things you sometimes come across in KPHP is you want to create a model instance somewhere in your controller, but the model has not been loaded before by, uh, let's say, your app controller by the controller itself. And maybe it's in a condition, so you don't always want to load it. And so previously, if you wanted to have an instance of a model, the way you would do it is you would call load model or like app import and uh, first of all make sure the file is loaded and after that you would create a new instance by just using the new keyword. The problem with this is in a big application creating model instances is one of the heaviest uh, I guess operations you can do costing you the most performance because the associations are built and so what you want to do is you want to check does there happen to be another instance of this model created already? which I could reuse for my code. And so uh, so if you wanted to do that, you had to write your custom function, looping through the class registry and all kinds of stuff. And now it's as simple as simply saying, um, let's say my post model I want to get is class registry dot init post. And this will return you a post model that's already initialized that you can do to, for example, let's say do a find all call. and uh, you don't have to worry about optimization because this will look, has any other part of your application already created a post model? And if so, you set instance and do not create a new one. So it's pretty cool to know that. Um, Presumably you can use that with any class, I think it works with like few too? No. All right. just, <laughs> no, class registry, so I presume you can use it with any class. No. Only model, I think, and maybe it's few. Uh, the more you use the registry, obviously the bigger it gets, the less advantage you have of using the registry. So if you're going to put every single class into the registry, there's no point to it. Um, the, the view class is in the registry, but really you should only have one view class in the registry at, at one time, as far as I'm concerned. Um, yeah, one of the common pitfalls using stuff like this is um, if you only have one model instance in the application, and you do things like before filters or anything that messes with the state of your model. And you then run another operation with the same instance, but you're not thinking about it. You may run into problems like, let's say, okay, one, one thing I had happened to me recently was I have my user model and I do a user exist check at one point and I have to set the ID for that. And so uh, this was happening in my before filter. 
but only if the user was not logged in already, which then I took the ID from the session. And so somebody came on without cookies, and suddenly on every request he was doing, some user ID on the model was set. And <coughs> then he came to the sign-up form, and on the sign-up form, uh, he was uh, creating a new user, but I, I didn't write any this user create function in the beginning. I didn't clear out my model data uh, because I was thinking when he comes to the control action and nothing has been done before to the controller or to the model, I can just set the data I want to save and then hit save. Well, guess what happened? Every time somebody signed up, he overwrote a user account in my database because there was already an ID being set. And so the lesson learned from that is if you use class registry in it or it, basically in any functions inside your model, Never assume the model to be in a state already, uh, like having no data, having no ID. Check if there's no ID, or make sure there's no ID. Or Never just always use atomic operations. Uh, which exists doesn't allow at this point. We should add that. Yeah, I guess that's a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Um, we got a couple more things. Which one is good? Debug or trace? Yeah, that's good. Yeah. <clears throat> one of the things you sometimes want to do, especially if you, let's say, match with request action uh, and stuff like this, you want to know uh, what your current call stack is, what function calls this function. Or if you're trying to write something recursive or something that is a little bit more complicated than a control action I'm going to use here, right. then you can say um, debug, debugger trace, and it will return you a call stack of all the functions that have been called before getting to this uh, delete uh, action. And actually, let me change this back to index. Yeah, you can actually pass that um, uh, parameter, uh, an array parameter that contains options, um, like there's a depth option if you only want it to do four calls back instead of getting the entire stack, and I forget all the options in there, but there's a few of them. Yeah, basically flexible function, and it will start at the bottom with main, then the dispatch function is called, then invoke, and then your control action. Basically, the same stack trace you get with an error message. Yeah. But you can call it anywhere in your code. Yeah. I kind of take that by uh, just doing a trigger error and kind of debug. Uh, yeah, uh, we'll do yeah. it. Yeah, same idea. Yeah. Or debug print back trace. Except that's like gigantic. Yeah, yeah. debug print back trace would do all kinds of stuff. Uh, the output formats too in debugger are new, so you can do multiple output formats. Um, yeah, for yeah, example. That's for errors, though. Yeah, let's yeah. let but let's show that. For example, one of the things that is a little annoying is if you trick have it, any error triggered, like let's say something went wrong, and it's a e user warning, for example. Then uh, the nice thing they did is it will actually uh, give you a neat little uh, JavaScript that you can pop up and see the calls stack and things like that. But let's say you're doing the same thing in an HX request. Well, guess what you see? All you're seeing is this right here. And now try to figure out where the PHP error is hidden in that. Yeah. And so in order to avoid this, what you can do is you can say, I think, debugger, what's the function name? Do you know? Output. Output. Yeah, exactly. And then set it to TXT. Yeah, TXT or text. Right yeah, and now it's just returning a plain string. And even <laughs> if it's returned in HX, then you can still see what's going on. Can you define your error format? Oh, uh, do not know. You just what, if, if you want to, what you can do is you can set output to false, and then you can use it again anywhere in an element, something like that, and you can do, you can get it back. So. Yeah. Um, sometimes you, for example, a common usage case I have a lot of times is I send out emails to people. And in the email, say, I want them to click a link. And now guess what happens if you just use the normal HTML helper URL function? So they will click the link, and then it will complain, well, there is no such ad address, because usually the links are created leaving out the base URL. So meaning your domain is not in the link name. It just starts with a slash. So your email program doesn't know what to do. Uh, a neat thing about the current router URL function is it has a second parameter, which you can set to true. And that will make sure you get the full base URL. So what does this mean? Let's just make a simple example. Let's say we want to get the URL to the post controller. Normally, this would just return us the absolute URL to where we are on the server, using the, assuming the current host. 
but if you pass in the second parameter, which is true, to, uh, as true, oh, yeah, got it. then it will actually do the full URL. And so you can use that inside of a, a yeah, email that you're sending out. Yeah. Just be aware of if you do the same thing inside like a Chrome chart, and it's not an HTTP request <laughs> coming in, then uh, it might not know that the server name is what you want it to be. Right, so you'd have to be sure to set um, the server, the underscore server variable manually. Yeah. So, but if it's an HTTP request triggering it, then it's safe to use this. Um, anything else? Who of you has used the file and folder class? Oh, okay. Oh, quite a couple. It's basically, those are two classes that are really neat for uh, making, getting a list of files or even searching a directory for files with a certain name using mm -hmm. a regex. You can use a file class for reading data, for outputting data. If you have file get contents, <coughs> you might want to just use that if you, all you need is a dump. But for example, the file class also allows you to just read the first 10 bytes. Mm -hmm. and it's kind of a neat wrapper for the PHP functionality dealing with files and folders. Yeah. And uh, actually, um, those are the classes I use to package up plugins in the uh, package upload installer. Yeah, and it also has like a lot of things you'd usually like go to the PHP manual because nobody remembers all those weird functions in PHP. Yeah. And uh, like for example, how can you uh, set the permissions on a folder? It's something you don't do all the time, and especially if you want to do it recursively. Definitely look up in the help. In here, it's just like, okay, it's a, it's a Gmod function. There's a parameter recursive, let's do it. And uh, right. so, so there's a lot of good stuff in both the file and the folder class that everybody should just look at and see what they can use of it. There's lots of tests for those. Yeah. <laughs> oh, in tab. <laughs> <laughs> what test is broken? What test is? That was super easy. Just a in path. Oh. Yeah, it was just because I'm on Windows and their packs were just... Insane. So the obvious solution is to switch to Mac or Linux. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that uh, didn't work. Yeah. The other thing is there are a lot of neat little helper functions that are not being promoted largely. Like, for example, there's a txt helper to list function, which does um, the following. Um, I think I have created a few for this. Yeah, it includes. So, what do you mean? I think you have to do it anyway. Oh, oh, okay. I also need to include the helper. Yeah. So let's say Nate, Garrett, and Larry. Yeah. Oh, I spelled Garrett wrong, didn't I? Yeah. It's two R. Yeah. Uh, two T. Oh, two T. Sorry. <laughs> and two R. <laughs> okay. I gotta do it right. So um, let's load the helper. <coughs> What this does is basically outputting like a humanized version of a string, meaning as long as it's not the last element, it's using a comma to separate the values, and for the last element, it's using an end. So, if you There's try a lot of simple string formatting stuff in the in the, in text, the text editor, yeah. If you want to tell a story with your KPHP application <laughs> and like put, put people's name in there randomly, that's a good way to do it. Or if you're like writing a blog post, <laughs> yeah. it's dynamically generated. Right. Yeah. I think we're pretty much out of time, so unless so there's like questions or something, or just some general ranting you want to do before the conference ends. This is your last chance yeah. to do it on video. Yeah. Alright, some history. Thanks, Felix.